Well, you all know the drill from part one. As a refresher, the rules are on screen, but basically I can't lose any units that are under my control, so anything that is the color blue. And I should be saving all the allies that I reasonably can. The only slight clarification for the rules from last time is that of course, deaths because of cutscenes don't count. Anyways, I'm going to try some different editing decisions in this video, including gushing about things I personally love about this game, speeding some footage up, slowing some footage down, and for some missions having longer explanations and longer raw footage sections. Let me know what you think about these changes in the comments. Also, I've uploaded the confirmation footage for part 1 and this part. You can find the links to those in the description of this video or part 1. Before getting into this mission, I just want to say, I absolutely love the conversation where you meet Amonra so much. Neither Arkantos nor Amonra engage in that, hmm, I don't trust you, let's fight a bunch until we do trust each other, BS that so many video game writers need to lean on to explain the gameplay and matchups. Amonra gives him the breakdown, Arkantos says yes ma'am, and they get to work. Some real instant best friends type of stuff. Son of a bitch. You heard the lady. Strengthen these defenses and prepare for attack. The Lost Relic is a mission where I need to have my laborers dig out a sword while I protect them. I start with 14 laborers and I can't train anymore. I need to choose how to allocate them. I decide to go for a quicker victory instead of a ton of production, seeing as Deathless gets harder to manage the more units I have, especially seeing as I only have access to squishy medium infantry. I have about half of my workers gather up enough resources for copper armory upgrades and to afford a small squad of medium axemen. After building the barracks and armory, I put all my workers on digging out the sword. There are three canyons the enemy attacks from, two of which have pre-existing fortifications. I decide to not bother adding any other towers or walls to the three entrances. The currently existing walls and towers along with my starting slingers and toxodes are enough to hold some early waves. The enemy will start bringing plenty of siege that will make any extra fortifications I build pointless. Instead, I clump up all the forces I'm going to really use at a central point where attack waves from all three entrances will wind up going, with my two starting priests in the back as a healing station. Speaking of which, let me talk about the priest. Each civilization has a way to train anti-myth unit hero units. The Greeks have a small set of named heroes that have high stats and you can only have one of each of them at a time, while Egyptians have priests. Priests are ranged, mass-producible heroes that have a healing ability they constantly use when out of combat. I freaking love priests. Their ranged pebbles are very accurate, they only cost gold, and from now on I will have a reliable and mobile source of healing for every single Egyptian mission. Getting access to them marks a huge turning point of convenience for me. This setup where I ignore the canyons is nice, because I don't have to worry too much about running from an entrance too slowly and my workers being backdoored. Even though the enemy attacks with champion spearmen, the axemen that I produced are the hard counter unit to other infantry, having both an insane anti-infantry multiplier and high base hack armor, meaning even with a huge upgrade deficit, they stomp the enemy spearmen, and they still do well against the enemy slingers who are horrible against any non-archer unit. Because I went so light on resource collection and mainly focused all my villagers on the main objective, I was able to excavate the sword and thus beat the mission pretty smoothly with my small force before the attack waves became unmanageable. In wedge. at you. Also, in case there are any non-believers out there who might think I'm not reviewing my footage with extreme thoroughness, I actually did this mission before with a slightly different strategy, and I thought I had it done deathless. But when I was reviewing the footage, I found it very hard to catch death. Can you catch it? Here's the death without an indicator. Into you. And here's the death with an indicator. So trust me, I watched that population meter like a hawk. Light Sleeper is a mission that I can only call a certified hood classic. In this mission, after you do a brief no build segment, you gain control of a base and vision of three allied villages. You need to bring the sword from the last mission to the heavily defended Osiris' guardian statue before Kempsit's army plows through all the allied villages and reaches the statue first. These allied villages are completely cut off from me, and I cannot reach them without bashing through the very fortified main enemy base, but I still need to think of a way to save as many of them as I can, seeing as I want to minimize allied deaths. It is literally impossible to save the first village. Even if I cheat myself a thousand food in advance to the classical age immediately, the village will be dead before I even finish advancing. 
So, I resolve to not only save the second village, but also save the three allied camels on the way to that village. I hold the line at the camels. This is my solemn oath. In order to do this, I start up my economy and advance through Ptah for his Shifting Sands God Power, which is mandatory if I want to save these villages, and then Hathor for her Sun-Dried Mud Bricks upgrade, as well as for the Laser Crocodile. When I feel the time is right, I put my plan into action. I use Shifting Sands to teleport 9 workers, a Laser Croc, and a Priest to the path that Kemset's army uses to advance, and I put up my wall in a position that defends the other villages and the three camels. The idea behind my strategy is that even though Kemset's army of high-tier myth units and war elephants is many times stronger than anything I'd be able to muster up, it has one fatal flaw. It is all melee only, meaning if I can hit them with ranged units from behind a wall, they can't kill anyone until they break down the wall. So if I build a strong enough wall and constantly repair it with villagers, I can eventually whittle the army down to dust. So using one laser croc and one priest, I can kill 18 champion war elephants, 12 scorpion men, and 14 avengers. If I hold this wall, I will be beating an army that outnumbers me 22 to 1. Leonidas doesn't have shit on me. So at this point, I had an absolute ton of resets caused by the so-called remaster. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I swear in the original Age of Mythology, units used to not be able to slide through walls at will. I don't understand why every remaster that isn't Age of Empires 2 just has to be crap, but there's this permanent feeling of bugginess in the Extended Edition, and so I legitimately don't know if I should do the Atlantean Deathless on the original or Extended Edition. Let me know if you have any thoughts on this in the comments. Anyways, I max out my wall upgrades and improve my economy as I periodically flick back to my very slow meat grinder setup to make sure my villagers are repairing. Because this game doesn't have auto repair, not paying attention for a while means my villagers will repair the wall to full and then stop repairing, which leads to the army breaking through the wall and causing a reset. Eventually, I build a proxy temple and make one more croc just to speed things up a little. One eternity later. After a long and hard battle, I breathe a deep sigh of relief knowing that I've saved all the camels I can, and now there's no time pressure on me. From here, I just build up a mass of sniper crocs and wall crawl up to the enemy base, and using the single catapult I was given at the start to clear buildings. The laser crocs are an amazing deathless unit, I'd even say the best ranged deathless unit. I said in my last video that wall crawling was a bit clumsy, but unlike almost any other ranged unit in the game, Laser Crocs have high durability, perfect accuracy, high damage, and insanely long range. All this means that I have room for error, I don't often have them trying to leave the walls to get in range, and the Crocs kill moving units or units that should counter them with ease. Because Hathor gives these Crocs and Sun-Dried Mud Bricks, which boosts building HP, I consider her the best defensive god in the game. Anyways, I snipe down all who would oppose me, and when I bring the sword to the statue, I instantly win, because I've already cleared out Kemset's attacking army in advance. Which means I get to miss out on the most fun and nostalgic part of the mission, which is rampaging with the god statue dealing thousands of cleaving damage per swing. The Guardian awakes. I'm bummed out that I did not get to showcase the glory of the God Statue annihilating massive armies like they were bugs. At least not while Deathless anyways. This mission and its ending were one of my core happy memories from childhood, but on the flip side, I'm really happy I managed to get value and a creative strat out of Shifting Sands, which is a god power I never thought about or used as a kid, and it feels really cool to discover an alternate victory condition for the mission. As a kid, I didn't appreciate the sheer creative potential and variety that this game had. Even in Warcraft 3, which is literally my favorite game of all time, I don't think I could come up with as many different or creative strategies for its campaign as I have in Asian mythology, which truly shows that not only was my love for this game not just nostalgia, but that I appreciate it more now than I did back then, even with me noticing more of the flaws. Tug of War is an interesting mission, where you need to claim control of an Osiris peace box and slowly escort it home while the enemy sends armies at you to reclaim it. This mission has an odd quirk where my starting troops at the Osiris cart will be different based on whether I watch the cutscene or skip the cutscene. No matter what, my heroes will start in their knocked out state. I have no control over that. But if I skip the cutscene, I will start with three badly damaged axemen in the middle of the enemy ambush. And if I watch the cutscene in full, 
all my ambushed units will just start off as being dead. I opt to watch the cutscene in full, because it is basically impossible to go deathless with those three liability axemen in the middle of a swarm of units, some of which are faster than them. I get started by training one chariot archer and one camelry out of my migdals, and with my massive starting resources and massive pre-built economy, I start with Anubis as my classical age god. So I grab the Necropolis upgrade which makes me generate favor faster, and I age up through Horus. I send the chariot archer over to my fallen heroes and I use the camelry's immense speed to start running to intercept the Osiris box. My Chariot Archer will both bait the initial enemy army into my pre-fortified base and revive my heroes by being a friendly nearby unit. My Camelry catches up to the cart perfectly in sync with my Horus popping and I use my newly gained Tornado God Power to fully kill the cart's escort, using my Camelry to sort of bait them into the Tornado. It felt very satisfying to be able to wipe an entire clump of units and to use Tornado in a way that I wasn't used to. I've always seen it as a strictly anti-building God Power. With the escort dead, I capture the cart and start moving home, and I move my recently rescued heroes to the cart to escort it. In the meantime, I'm going for a Priest Avenger composition, and getting basically all the priest relevant upgrades that I can. I started this mission with Nephthys as my heroic age god, and she gives me access to not one, but two huge priest upgrades. Funeral Rites, which gives a massive 50% overall damage increase against myth units, and Spirit of Mod, which makes my priests cheaper and doubles their healing rate. Along with Tornado, going Horus for Mythic Age also gives me the Avenger. Horus's Avenger is the perfect unit for a deathless run. Most of the tanky units I use in this game come with the trade-off of being slow and clumsy. The Avenger sports 600 HP and good armor, while also being very fast and not having an overly large hitbox making them very easy to use and preserve. Better yet, their Spinning Blade special attack is both very powerful against clumps of units and very easy to use because it has no clumsy startup or wind down animation. And it is generally a special attack that will get value even with zero micro, as opposed to the special attack of, for example, the Cyclops, which I would argue is so clumsy and slow it is sometimes worse than having no special attack at all. On top of all this, the Avenger has an excellent DPS of 28 hack. All of this combined means that just a few can take on massive clumps of enemies while I build up a good priest count. Once I reach a certain point, Kemset uses Shifting Sands to drop a ton of Anubites on me, but I am already well prepared and take them out. Then, right before I make it to my base, three loaded rock transports fly in to drop an army on me. And this right here is why I invested so much in Priests. With maxed out weapons and the Funeral Rites upgrade, they do insane range DPS to Myth Units, so I snipe down all three of the rocks in epic and accurate volleys of Priest Hadoukens. And then, I have a buttery smooth end of the mission. It's our only chance! <laughs> In wedge. In wedge. In Isis, hear my plea is a mission where you are given a large mass of various myth units and an absurd amount of favor production. Using this, you are tasked with destroying a Migdal stronghold to create a diversion so that a Monra can get to a dock and rescue her friends from a prison island. Unfortunately for this mission, I saw the speedrun, and plagiarism is my middle name. The idea behind the speedrun is simple. Amonra's leap special ability lets her jump to an enemy, and she flies over obstacles like walls. So I garrison my villagers both so they don't get sniped by an occasional attack wave, and so that the Citadel Town Center does more damage, seeing as buildings from that attack scale up with how much population is garrisoned inside. I place my sniper crocs behind the stronghold to provide supporting fire, and now I can mostly just ignore everything and take Amonra, Jump her past the bandit walls and the bandits that you're supposed to distract with a frontal assault, hop into the transport boat, build a couple of siege ships to shred the defending enemy towers and ships that could kill the transport ship with the Monra in it, land a Monra on the objective island, and I pretty much win with ease. Get it. Tie you. Tie you. Tie you. Here if there. Free them. We must escape this city. You e air. Let's Go is a mission where you need to capture a well-guarded Osiris piece and then escape with it. The trick is that this piece is teleported to different fortified bases every 10 minutes. I do the trivial no-build segment, take the boats to my base, and start up my economy. I want this mission to be simple and not get overwhelmed with attack waves, so my goal is to rescue the Osiris piece before it gets moved even once. The starting prison it is held at is by far the closest to me, meaning I have to break the least amount of defenses to get to it. I rush up to Thoth for his phoenixes while defending ground attack waves from the north and naval-slash-drop-off attack waves from the east. 
On my way to Thoth, I go Neftis, because she lets me train the Leviathan Aquatic Myth Unit. It has very high HP and damage, so training one will help me hold the nasty naval attack wave with a clump of siege ships that could insta-kill my boats. The Leviathan also has the ability to transport units, so now I have a much safer option than using my transport boats, which are made out of paper. Once I hit Mythic, I start making Phoenixes and get ready to attack. Phoenixes deal hack and crush damage in an area, making them good against buildings and clumped up units. Once I have some Phoenixes, I move out with them and my heroes. I use Meteor to break the initial towers and troops, and then I clean up with my forces. Once I claim the piece, I don't feel as much time pressure, because Kemsit won't teleport it out anymore. I use the Setna hero to heal up my forces between fights, and I'd gradually push my way out of the base. To be honest, I felt disappointed by the Phoenixes. I thought they were going to be the perfect deathless unit because their flight should make them very easy to do pullback micro on, and it makes them literally immune to half the units in the game. 400 health is very respectable for a flying unit, and 30 hack and 30 crush damage should be a crap load of damage, especially in an area of effect. There are two things I realized that help explain why they felt bad. First is that I did not actually know that towers actually have a 3 times multiplier against flying units. Second, the damage tooltip for Phoenixes is wrong. Generally, the listed damage amount of a unit is its damage per second, not its damage per attack. However, Phoenixes are one of the exceptions, and for some dumb reason, their listed damage is their damage per attack. And because they attack way slower than once per second, their actual DPS is pretty low. I do get some satisfying AoE hits on a squad of Anubites blocking my exit. I take my Osiris piece to the extraction point, and I win. In wait, in Good Advice is a dream mission that consists of three parts, two short no-build segments and then the actual meat and potatoes. The first segment is a joke. Just right-click on the enemy myth units and clear through with lightning statues and free god power supporting me. And then I- wait, crap, let me just move these guys. Okay, once all of my friends go to a sunny pasture on Mountain Olympus and totally don't die off-screen, we get to the next segment, which is considerably harder. Here I need to push through some myth units and then survive against waves of myth units as I destroy some boulders that are blocking my way. I'm given a large army of spearmen, chariot archers, priests, catapults, the suicide shades from mission 10, and this weird kid who keeps calling me father. Unfortunately, everything but our cantos, the priests, and the catapults are liabilities. So I move the liabilities to the beginning of the level. I need the priests to snipe and tank a little against myth units while I need the catapults to destroy the boulders. Once I'm in position, I start attacking the boulders with my catapults and pop the flaming weapons god power that I'm pre-given. Flaming Weapons massively amplifies the damage of my units for 60 seconds and will give me enough damage to kill off each wave fast enough to not get overwhelmed by the next wave. I use Restoration to heal a priest who is getting focused down, and Zeus gives me a free lightning storm. And at this point I can relax and look at how cool the catapult boulders look with flaming weapons on. Now we are at the twist section where you start playing as the bad guys, and boy is there a lot to talk about here. This part is the actual bulk of the mission, and is also where I want to talk about relics, mission 4, and gastrophetes. While I micro with krakens, which I finally get to use during the aquatic no build segment of this mission, I'll talk about relics. This mission is absolutely littered with relics, you can't go somewhere without tripping on one. You may have noticed that I haven't really talked about relics, and let me assure you, I do know that they exist and how they work. There are two reasons I haven't talked about them much. Reason one is that while in some missions I was finding some relics, their impact on the missions has been pretty low. Except for the villager move speed in mission 5, I usually find relics that aren't correct for the situations I'm in. And reason two is that Extended Edition has this weird thing where upon restarting a mission, relics sometimes reset to different relics, including the almighty relic. This mission though, I get a ton of very powerful and relevant relics, including the Tower of Cestus, which boosts the damage of my towers, 
Arrows of the Alphar, which boosts the damage of all my buildings, and Nose of the Sphinx, which boosts the health of my buildings, and the Tail of Cerberus, which makes my myth units use their special attacks more often, which is useful because I start off with an army of various myth units. After landing and claiming my base, I use the lightning statues and myth units that I am pre-given to defend my base while I build up. I start with three lightning statues, which are an insanely powerful, non-buildable, campaign-only building that does 120 crush damage, 120 hack damage, and 100 pierce damage in a chain lightning that hits multiple enemies. This, combined with the myth units I start with, lets me defend my base from heavy attack waves while I build up. So now to talk about Mission 4. Mission 4 is the only mission in the campaign where the enemy has access to Bolt, a point target, unavoidable, instant kill god power. So how did I manage to not get Bolt the entire time? Well, it looks like the designers used Bolt as an opportunity to teach you about the value of the Pegasus Scout unit. Basically, the enemy AI is coded to first use its Pegasus to get vision of a specific unit, and then the AI will use Bolt to kill that unit. This essentially teaches you that you can use Pegasus to get vision on something even if it is deep inside an enemy base. In the case of Mission 4, the AI was specifically locked onto one of my Hippocon. It would fly the Pegasus to the Hippocon, and once the Pegasus had vision of the Hippocon, it would be bolted. So to deal with this, I was building towers at specific spots in my base, and hiding the Hippocon in a spot that would force the Pegasus to fly through tower fire to get to it. Now, in this mission, the Pegasus mechanic is back, except now the enemy Pegasus is locked onto my town center, and it uses Earthquake when it gets vision, which would destroy my base. Because I can't move my town center to a safer spot, I need to tower up much harder than last time. Thankfully, I'm playing Hades as my major god, who passively boosts building damage as one of his god bonuses. And I have both tower damage relics. All of this combined gives me nearly the highest theoretical possible tower damage. I wish so bad that I could talk about the exact numbers, but Age of Mythology's damage display is broken and inconsistent, and I don't know which sources to trust for this. Anyways, remember those lightning statues I was talking about? Well, my enemy actually has a couple of them defending his base too. In order to not die against them, I'll need something that can outrange them. I decide to use Gastrophetes. Gastrophetes are Hades' unique unit, and they're kinda weird. Basically, they're a siege unit archer hybrid. They have the mobility and small hitbox size of Toxodes, making them much easier to control than any other siege weapon. But unlike Toxodes, they have extremely long range and hidden crush damage, making their primary use case against buildings, though with maxed out upgrades they're pretty decent at killing anything as long as they're behind cover. I break through the first part of the base and the defending armies by wall crawling with my Gastrophetes, and then I slowly push my way through the base and snipe down the objective wonder, winning me the mission. <laughs> It's no wonder to rubble. Jackal's Stronghold is a mission where you are meant to push through Kemset's massive base with Amonra's army, and the main objective is to get her to Kemset for a showdown. However, if you listen to the mission objective carefully, you might be able to guess where this is going. All the objective actually requires is for Amonra to physically reach a destination. The base I'm given after the trivial no-build segment already has a dock, and waiting to be trained in that dock is our friend the Leviathan, and my starting resources are just enough for me to build him. It's like they wanted me to cheese this one. I hop in, and instead of going the shortest way to the beachhead, I go all the way around. This is because if I take the shortest route, there is a large naval army along the way that will intercept. I skirt around the edge, drop off Amonra, send the Leviathan off to the corner of the map, and get to jumping. Once I jump over all the walls, I approach Kempset and dodge arrows as the screen fades to black. Where are you hiding, Kempset? We have reached for your silence box. Where is my enemy? A Long Way From Home is a mission where you need to capture the center of the map with a giant tamarisk tree and then hold the position while your workers chop the tree down. I'm given some Norse allied cavalry for this mission. I'm going to consider the three raiding cavalry as liabilities, but the Jarls I'm going to get some use out of. As I start setting up my economy, I send out the Jarls to one of two mummy temples, which will periodically send out attack waves of mummies which can end my run instantly because their special ability flat out just insta-kills any non-hero unit. These temples are virtually unguarded except for the couple of dung beetles that live inside of them, so my Jarls can kill both the temples before they even send out the first set of mummies. As an added bonus, each temple gives you a large 1,500 gold payout upon destruction which will jumpstart my economy wonderfully, especially seeing as you don't have a gold mine at your starting base. My plan is to take up to Thoth and then go with war elephants and priests. 
War Elephants are the only human unit that I consider a truly amazing deathless option. They have the health, armor, and damage of advanced myth units. They have nearly triple the health of the next strongest human unit, but unlike myth units, they do not take immense damage from heroes. While they are classified as cavalry and are countered by cavalry counter units, the potential anti-cavalry multipliers are much lower than the hero anti-myth unit bonuses. And my enemy, because they are also Egyptian, don't actually have access to any of the true cavalry counters like Prodromos anyways. Elephants also have an anti-building multiplier, just for fun. Elephants are truly the colossus of the Egyptian faction, with no real weakness except for being slow and big. As I am maxing out my elephants with champion upgrades, I say thank you to Thoth for the Tusks of Apatimok upgrade, giving my elephants another nice HP and attack bonus. When I get a large mass of elephants and priests, I move out. I capture the middle with ease and I bring my workers over. My workers first build a couple of Migdal strongholds for on-site elephant pumping. These Migdals also can actually garrison elephants, making saving them in the middle of battle much easier. Annoyingly, the biggest attack wave that gets sent against me doesn't actually go for the tree like it's supposed to, but instead goes for my base. This might be because I didn't actually start chopping the tree right away when I captured the center, so attack waves weren't focusing the middle yet. Anyways, I intercept the giant misdirected wave, and I hold out until my workers finish chopping, and then I win. <laughs> Watch your step starts with a small, no build segment before getting to your Egyptian base via a stolen pirate ship. And then from that base, you need to build up an army to destroy Kamos' base. Arkantos and Ajax are more than enough to solo this part. But the resistance here is simple enough that I can use my starting army without a loss. Mm. And now that we've rescued our allies... Oh, oh, oh man you guys, doing a deathless run is exhausting. Could you make sure nothing happens to my game? I need to hit the hay. Wait, what? What is this? The best unit in the game? In such a ridiculous quantity that it exceeds our population cap? Dang, you guys should have warned me that leaving the game on overnight while my ally spawn a colossus every 10 minutes would do this. <sighs> oh well, only one thing to do now. Release the Kraken!
Where they belong is the final mission of the Egyptian campaign, where you start with two split bases that get hit with brutal attack waves, with the objective of bashing through an enemy controlled map to get all three Osiris pieces we've obtained in the previous missions to the last heavily guarded Osiris piece at the gate to Tartarus. This mission is a struggle. There's no cheese or easy strats here. My early game plan is to pump workers and immediately go chop lumber so that I can connect my bases immediately. I need to make sure that both my heroes and my starting Norse cavalry can defend either base because the AI constantly switches which base it attacks. To the point that even on the same save, 10 seconds before an attack, it can decide to attack a different base. I do not know if this is influenced by where my heroes or Osiris cards are, but it feels practically arbitrary slash random. Once I finish connecting my bases, my economy can boom with all the workers I've produced and I can start actually teching up and fielding an army. I generally keep my cavalry out of combat and have my town centers kill the bulk of the attack waves, but the siege towers, which are the reason I can't just wall off, will destroy my town centers. So what I do is once the other units of an attack wave are dead, I send in my cavalry to snipe down the siege towers. My cavalry do much better than I expected, and that is in big part because the three rating cavalry actually have a nice two times multiplier against siege weapons, which melts the squishy versus hack siege towers. Fortified Town Centers is a particularly useful upgrade to get this mission, seeing as in the early game, my Town Centers are doing most of the work defensively. Fortified Town Centers gives a huge damage boost and 5 population to Town Centers, and because I start with 2 Town Centers, I get a nice 10 population boost. At some point, I get hit with a particularly large attack wave, but my production isn't in full swing. I have to use Tornado to kill the enemy army. It's not a waste at all. The army I'm going to make is going to smash any units or buildings. It's much more important to survive early than to have Tornado for my Siege. My army of choice, similar to my tug of war composition, is going to be Avengers, Priests, and now Catapults. If I can make a maxed out army of this, it will be able to kill absolutely anything with no losses and heal to full. It has virtually no counters. I've already touted how amazing Avengers are, but another great thing about them is that their speed means that they can actually dodge arrows from any shooter with a low track rating like Chariot Archers. You may have noticed at the beginning that I researched the Necropolis upgrade. Fun fact about this mission, the major god you are given is Ra, and your classical age is Anubis. In normal play, this is actually an impossible combination, because Ra can only have Ta or Bast. What this means is that I can actually have faster favor generation than is actually theoretically possible for Egyptian. Necropolis boosts favor generation for my monuments, but then on top of that, I use Ra's unique ability of priests being able to empower resource structures to empower every single monument. This adds another global 15% favor production boost on top of the one I already have from Necropolis. This impossibly high favor generation is a big reason why I'm going for the favor hungry Avengers as my mainline unit. Even though I would have built Avengers no matter what, it feels great to pump them out at max efficiency. As I build up a critical mass of Avengers, defense becomes pretty trivial and I calmly max out and move out. From there I just have catapult snipe towers and walls, and I meet up with Arkantos who spawns in with his Osiris piece in tow on the right side of the map at the 20 minute mark. From here I just wash over the enemy base and win. As much fun as it is to cheese a mission, there's a certain crisp satisfaction that I get when I get a well deserved win on a difficult mission. Well, this is it for the Egyptian campaign. I have the Norse footage, but editing does take me a while, so sorry for the delay. Thank you guys again so much for watching and all your lovely thoughts and responses. I do read every single comment, and they do bring me joy. If you think there's an editing idea I tried that didn't quite work, let me know. Anyways, I'll see you in the Norse and the Titans campaign.